Hey, it's Anthony with HowToGetIntoDramaSchool.com. Hope you're having a great day. It will be made even better when you listen to this podcast. This is my friend, my Juilliard classmate, and Tony Award winner, Gabriel Ebert. He shares his tips on how to get into drama school. And without further ado, let's get into it. HowToGetIntoDramaSchool.com. Here's Gabe. I'll let you have the floor for like, you know, 30 seconds or a minute. Give us the personal background. Where were you before you auditioned for all these drama schools? How did you, how, what was your story leading up to all these auditions? Yeah. So I grew up in a small town in Colorado. And um, when I was a kid, I, my father's a minister. So I grew up in church singing. And then eventually my church would put on little plays and I would sort of perform in those plays. From that, I went and um, I was in a choir for several years. So I grew up singing and dancing um, ever since I can remember. And there's a great high school for performing arts uh, called the Denver School of the Arts that I was lucky enough to audition and get into. So in a way, I feel like I had a sort of running start to college auditions because I auditioned to get into high school as well. And mm. I studied drama um, in high school at Denver School of the Arts. And I also was able to minor in choir. And um, so I felt I was, I had a nice springboard to leap into college auditions because we had been sort of uh, dwelling in that territory all of my years in high school. I really wanted to make it to New York City because I love the theater and I always wanted to end up in New York. So my ideal was actually NYU. For some reason, my way of life, I'd never heard of Juilliard until a friend of mine who was in a class above me said, you know, if you want to go to New York, you should really, you should really apply to Juilliard. And that's when I started doing research. I, uh, in my junior year, I got to fly to New York with my mother and we toured some of the colleges and my experience at Juilliard was so positive. And once I really learned the difference between their curriculum and NYU's and that theirs was a conservatory training, um, that's where my sights were steadfastly set from that point forward. Nice. Very cool. Very cool. I, I, I've heard most of that, but it's always good to, to relive it. It's such an exciting time, right? Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, so let's talk about like the really leading up to it. I, I want to get into like what the audition room was like, but I, before we get into the actual audition room, how did you decide on like the pieces? Let's talk about your pieces. So Absolutely. give us, Absolutely. uh, what were the pieces and, and then where did you find them? So I ended up with four monologues, two classical and two contemporary, which was the, uh, at the time was <laughs> what you did. And I also had my, my, um, you know, 16 bars to sing or my 32 bars to sing, whichever people wanted. So this is something I think can be helpful to your listeners is I was very set on doing monologues, especially classical monologues that were really obscure, that these people wouldn't have seen or heard in a long time. And so I searched through the Shakespeare plays. And I remember at the time I had a monologue from the jailer in Cymbeline. And then I had a monologue, mm -hmm. um, son who kills his father, which is from like Henry the sixth part three. And I remember showing these to um, the lady who ran my drama program in high school, my incredible teacher, Sean Han, and also to someone I was working with. A, I was working with an alumni, of Juilliard, who was sort of helping me with my monologues. And I remember them saying, to me, why are you picking these obscure monologues? What are you doing? Why are you doing the jailer? And I said, well, you know, I, I want them to be surprised by the material I choose. And I thought a very valuable piece of information I was given was, don't surprise them with the material you choose. Surprise them with who you are as a performer. Surprise them with what you bring to the table. She's like, you need to do Romeo. You need to do Prince Carol and Romeo. You don't need to be doing the jailer and uh, the father who kills his son or the son who kills his father. You need to be doing these great pieces because this is the time of your life that you're in. And I think you have unique access to this material. Don't surprise them with what you choose. Surprise them with how you bring Romeo into the room. And so that and so that was really positive for me. And I think that that's something that can be helpful is that it's not so much the obscurity or the cleverness of the pieces that you choose. It's about what you bring of yourself to the pieces that you end up doing. So long answer, the pieces I ended up doing were What Light Through Yonder Window Breaks from Romeo and Juliet. Oh my God. Yeah. Yeah. I know. I, instead <laughs> of going from the most obscure, I went right to the hits. <laughs> Yeah, my other monologue from classical was um, Henry the Fourth, Part One, uh, Prince Hal's speech. I know you all, and will a while uphold. Um, 
great speech. And then also because I was around great theatrical minds, my, my contemporary pieces were from The Normal Heart, Beautiful. Uh, yeah. incredible play, and from, oh my goodness, what was my fourth piece? I'm, oh yes, from Burn This by Lanford Wilson. Oh wow. Which in a, in a cool turn of events, we got to do in our fourth year season, and I was able to be in that production. I was in a different role, but uh, you know, I got to do in my fourth year the play that I auditioned with. So that was kind of a nice bookend for me. Absolutely. Um, so let's talk about academics. I know a lot of students are looking at academic requirements and having academic considerations. What were your academics like? Of course. One thing I, by this point, was pretty honest with uh, with myself was that I was not a great academic student. If I really applied myself to math, um, I could find success in it, but I was always, um, in high school, I was always in the plays. I was always in the choir. And so I had a lot of extracurricular activities. And then also, you know, I was a 16, 17 year old kid. And so when I had some free time, I didn't want to work on my science or my math. And when it came time for testing, standardized testing, you know, like, um, the SAT, uh, or the, what's the other one? The A something. Jeez. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Shows you how well I did. Um, that my my test scores were not necessarily to the level that I think um, NYU was hoping for. And so I also realized when I toured their facility and I got to meet some of their students that a large portion of their time is taken up with liberal arts. And when I got to tour Juilliard and I looked at the schedule on the wall, that immortal wall that has the schedule, do you know what I'm talking about? Outside 304? Of course. First year. I remember looking at those blocks of time and thinking, now this is a way that I could apply myself. I had discipline for certain things when I could apply myself, but uh, my attention really wandered in these other areas. And so I thought, man, here's a place where I can gain the discipline that I seek, uh, but it can all be geared towards my passion. And I felt like at other schools, you know, I also looked at the School of Arts in Philadelphia. I looked at Emerson College in Boston and all these were great programs. I met some really good people there, but none of them had the, uh, the rigor that Juilliard seemed to have. And also Juilliard wasn't as concerned with my um, lack of mathematical genius. <laughs> mm -hmm. yeah. Right, right, right. Um... And the vibe, I must say, was so good. The student who took me on the tour was so kind. We met Kathy Hood, and she spoke with such reverence about uh, the work. And I thought I could feel the passion dripping off the place in ways that I couldn't at other schools. And so there was something also being there that just felt life-affirming. There was like a spiritual connection almost. Mm -hmm. Yeah, man, it is. It's, it's great. Um, mm -hmm. People obviously always talk about you know auditioning for Juilliard as just a great experience, whether they got called back or not. It's Absolutely. You know, it's just a great place to be doing uh, artistic work. About the monologues, um, where did you find those monologues? Like, did you just have somebody give you a list of monologues and you look through them? Did you search through your drama library? Like, where did you actually find those four pieces you ended up choosing? Well, I was fortunate enough to work with, as I was saying, an alumni. She was in group four. Her name's Christine Beyer. And her husband was in the band at the church that my dad was a minister at. And so I had sort of known them for years. Her kids also went to the art school, but they studied music. Um, and she was the one who gave me Prince Hal and Romeo. Up until okay. that point, I had been scouring through my complete works of Shakespeare, looking for obscure things and plays. And I think I found the jailer because I was like, oh, here's a series. Here's a monologue on this page. And I was like, oh, that's kind of cool. Jailer was spelled G-A-O-L-E-R. I thought, oh, no one's going to know who Gayoler is. <laughs> you know, and it wasn't, until, it wasn't until I read them for her that she was like, no, 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 don't do these. And then when it comes to the normal heart and burn this, I think that uh, my, my teacher, Sean Han, in high school, um, she takes great pride in, in setting her students up to go audition for colleges. And um, every year, the juniors come to New York from Denver, and I... If I'm in New York and if I'm working on a play, I always have those students come to the theater I'm working at, or I'll meet them at Juilliard and I'll take the tour with them. And um, she really helped me find those pieces. I think she handed both pieces to me, to be honest. That's perfect. Do you remember like in high school, like obviously we're, we're going to acting school because we need better training or we want the next level, I should say. 
of training. Mm-hmm. And, and I was keenly aware uh, as I was auditioning for all of these schools, like where my strengths lied and where my weaknesses lied. And but you'd also been competing yeah. since you were young. Say again? You'd also been competing in voice and speech debates since you were yeah. young. I feel like you had a oh, different yeah. way because of that, too. Of course. we Our experiences kind of shaped us. Um, but I was thinking, like, do these schools, am I not going to get into some of these schools because of the weaknesses? You know, I don't know how much they care about my weaknesses or if I'm supposed to sort of be honest about my weaknesses or if I'm supposed to just put my best foot forward and show all my strengths. You know, there were Absolutely. questions. And I think that what we've found from our folks who have gotten into the best schools, they've figured out a way to be OK with where they're at strengths and weaknesses wise and still kind of portray confidence or just, you know, show up in the room authentically rather than putting on some sort of uh what the school, what they think the schools want to see. Um, so my question to you is, yeah, like what weaknesses did you have going in and how did you respond to those uh, before you kind of audition? Yeah, that's a great question. Uh, one thing I'll say before I answer this question is just, I remember when I was working the auditions later, when I was in my third and fourth year and, um, the professor said something really brilliant to the group. He said, I'm not here to find people who, are already polished and ready to go. I'm here to find students who I can work with. Mm. And so I, we're not looking for someone who's got it all figured out and someone who's all ready to go. That You don't need to be here if that's the case. I'm looking for yeah. people I can work with, students that I can be with. Um, and I thought that was a really beautiful sentiment. So absolutely, the things, that I felt, the things that I felt I needed to work on, when I came in, I was kind of the class clown, I think. And I think for the first year, I sort of operated in our class in that way too. as like the goofy one, the happy-go-lucky one, the guy who you're never really going to have an argument with because he'll go along with whatever. And I think what I brought to my pieces was um, a sort of quickness and a lightness. And I think that I can, I could at the time get a laugh out of things. And what I was asked to then work on for the next several years was um, to not look for a way to get a laugh, but to look for the depth. And I think they didn't get, let me play a clown again until end of third year. And, and, and all before that, I was playing killers and kings and you know rapists. I had to go through some really dark times in, in year two and three because um, they trusted that I had the clown thing, but they made me put it aside. And I think that that You know, at the time it was scary, but um, it rounded out who I am as an artist. And and, um, now, you know, I should probably get more laughs when I'm trying to make people cry. (laughs) Yeah, you were just in last year, uh, Mr. Mercedes, right? And you were playing this like very dramatic character. Very true. Very true. (laughs) Um, I tried laughs in there. What can I say? Yeah, I'm sure you did. I'm sure you, you, you know, played it great. We want to hear about the actual audition now. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and we're not just talking about Juilliard, like, you know, we're talking about college auditions in general. Okay. Yeah. That one is the one that sticks out in my mind, but I okay. did also audition in Boston and I did also um, audition at NYU. These experiences were more sort of sit in the waiting room with a few other hopefuls, keep your eyes on the floor. You go in, you have your five minutes. That was my experience in those schools. And I, no one was cold to me, but I didn't feel a particular warmth. Um, I auditioned in New York for Juilliard, and I was really struck that there's 150 kids here for this session, and they start the day by coming in and having us all stretch together. And, <laughs> and, the warm-up. and Richard Feldman, the great Richard Feldman, gave us a little speech and kind of put us at ease. And I remember talking to my fellow auditioners and being like, wow, where are you from? Oh, my goodness. Uh, how great. What other schools are you auditioning for? There was a camaraderie already built in. Um, I made it through the morning session. I remember this was kind of a harrowing moment, but the first, you know, the 150 kids auditioned. I was maybe in the 60s or 70s. And then you wait. They post a list of who gets to come back later that evening. And it was maybe seven names, you know. He's like, oh, my goodness. I was very lucky to be one of those seven names mm-hmm. so my mom and i had a cup of coffee came back and did the night session but wait before we get to the callback let's talk about the actual initial audition like you your Thank name you. gets called right, what happened okay so my name gets called 
as I said, I was standing in the hallway with someone, with a student who was currently at Juilliard at the time. Um, I think it was Jamario Stills, if I recall. Oh. And he was incredibly kind to me and supportive of me and said, you, you got this, go do it, go do your thing, you know? And I remember thinking, oh, I do got this. I, I, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so I go in and uh, for the initial audition, I was in a room with a table of three adjudicators uh, who later all came to be my professors. I think it was Becky, Guy, Deb. Your listeners don't care. Anyways, no, people we love. But that's great. Thank you. Um, they had me do all four of my monologues, which was Whoa. interesting. No other school had asked me that. I had only done two at every other school. And so I thought, ooh, either they don't like my first two pieces or maybe they're interested. They want to see more. You know, I tried not to get too dark. I think at the time I was so excited that I didn't let my mind go too dark. Uh, I didn't, I, like, doubt didn't infiltrate too deeply. Um, so I did all four monologues and they had me sing. And I had chosen, you know, 16 bars of a pop song and I sang that there. Um, they didn't give me much, they didn't give me much feedback in the room. Uh, they were very kind and they thanked me very much. And yeah, um, very just straightforward, simple, not much feedback, just taking you in. Taking me in. Exactly. They didn't have me do an adjustment on any of my monologues or anything. Okay. Okay. Very cool. And that was the initial audition. That was the initial audition. And then I waited for a couple hours for the list to be posted. It got posted. And then there was like an hour break and we came back for the evening session. Yeah. So um, what happened in the room in the evening? The evening session was cool. I think maybe there were more than seven, nine of us or something. It started with, we all walked in and the entire faculty was sitting in one room in a sort of semicircle. And we were led by the movement instructor, all of the callback people, all nine of us in a game where we had to play with a ball. And I think this, at the time, I just thought, oh, how fun. You know, I felt like a Labrador. I'm like, this is great. I love playing with ball. <laughs> but, but uh I think they were trying to see who works well as a team, who can play with others as opposed to who tries to take it and make it about themselves, you know? And I think that it, yeah, they were able to see from that in retrospect. At the time, it just felt like um, they were keeping us loose. They were showing us that this is fun, that we don't have to take this too seriously. Um, so it started with that, and then we each went in one by one. And when I came in for my solo session, I'd already seen the room, which was intimidating, the entire faculty sitting in a semicircle, which must have been, I don't know, 15 people. Mm -hmm, right. Um, and then when I came in for my monologues, I remember I did Romeo and then I got an adjustment and I had to do it again. And then I got an adjustment and I had to do it again. And then I did all what three did, of my pieces. What did they, what did, they had, did they say like, do it completely different or what did, do you remember? You know, my memory of it was that I was encouraged. I, I was really playing to the audience. As you can imagine, knowing my work, I was hamming it up pretty. Oh, yeah. Pretty oh, yeah. <laughs> That's how you get the Tony, babe. You're, le <laughs> You're leaning into the strength. I was leaning into the Christmas ham. And I was encouraged, I remember, to not play so much to the audience, but play to the wonder of Juliet. And they said, place Juliet here on the wall. And so I they they uh they took this big beam that I was shooting out and they made it a laser. I think it's mm -hmm. ultimate. That's awesome. that I can, they said focus this energy. Um, and I remember I got them all to laugh at one point, but it was a genuine laugh. It wasn't one of those things that I've been trying out of them. It was like something new happened in the room, and so I think that was also a good mm -hmm. moment for them because they thought, oh, I, we can work with this guy. There's raw material here that we can help shape. Um, I had brought my guitar cause I'm also a guitar player. And I said, Oh, well, can I sing you a song? I brought on my guitar. And they said, that's very kind, but no. And I said, Oh, well, why not? <laughs> said, well, we want to, we want to see you sing without your guitar. And I, I, that also was a good lesson because I've realized I had been hiding behind my guitar for years. You can kind of hide behind an instrument. And when you have to sing without one, you're fully exposed. And there's something mm -hmm. very vulnerable about that. And so I realized why they didn't want me to sing with my guitar. Uh, but I felt like I was in that room for 20 minutes, you know, and an incredibly high octane 20 minutes, but very positive. They were very kind. I mean, even if I hadn't gotten in at that point, I thought this is one of the best days I've ever spent in the theater in my life. 
Mm, yeah. And that's, that's it, man. I mean, we get all sorts of folks that, you know, we uh, support and we coach that, you know, make it to various levels of that callback um, mm-hmm. and, and other schools too, but the Juilliard is kind of just a harrowing or it's like a, it's just a cathartic experience, no matter what level you get to, if you get past that initial audition, you, you know, you're gonna have a great time as an actor. Mm-hmm. And of course it's different now than it was when we were, when we were boys, you know, they have the, the group of 40 that they call back when I was mm-hmm. there, they did it all in one day. There was even a further callback after that callback that I did, where I had to come in and read a chapter of a book to them. Yeah. Yeah. Was it uh, under Milkwood? You know, I think it was actually Waves by Virginia Woolf. Oh, interesting. Interesting. Yeah. yeah. Let me read Virginia Woolf to them to see how I can read. <laughs> yeah. I did under Milkwood. I mean, it's just huge text. So just, hard. It's just so very hard. complicated. Yeah. Can you yeah. just commit? You know, Um, I want to go, I want to transition to family considerations. Mm -hmm. A lot of students uh, may be very talented or, 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 or be totally qualified. Don't really get to talk about some personal matters and obviously share what you're willing to share. I'm not forcing you to share anything, but we do want to know, like, was there any conversations around having a backup plan? Um, yes, I had a backup school. I, someone that I knew in Colorado, uh, who ran a drama program at UNC in Greeley, the University of Northern Colorado, had known my work throughout high school, uh, from different festivals that I was competing in, the Thespian Convention, and he had offered me a full ride scholarship if I didn't, and, and as he said, he said, you can come here for free if you don't get into Juilliard. Mm. And, you know, I felt very confident that I was going to study drama no matter what. I didn't have a backup plan as in like, well, I'll go be a pediatrician. Yeah, Um, yeah, yeah. I was always going to do this. I just had a backup plan if I couldn't uh, make it work at Juilliard. And, And, you know, the finances at Juilliard are incredibly intense, but I felt, um, I felt very lucky at the time. I was very steadfast on going to that school. So I did all of the paperwork that was required. I applied for absolutely every bit of financial aid. Through my first three years, I worked uh, work study hours a lot. And I was also fortunate enough to receive um, two merit-based scholarships while I was at Juilliard. So I was able to subsidize a good amount of my uh, tuition through luck is what it feels like, but through merit and hard work is the way that I would like to put it. Yeah, absolutely. Um, Definitely deserved all that. You know, we, um, everyone uh, who received those merit-based scholarships, it's kind of interesting because, you know, you don't really go in to audition for the merit-based scholarship or anything like that, Mm -hmm. right? It's just somewhere, somehow, some of those faculties determined that's what we got. And um, Mm -hmm. Pretty, you know, admirable. Now, I don't want to downplay what you did receive at school. You received the most coveted scholarship, I think, that Juilliard has to offer an actor, which is in our fourth year, you received the Robin Williams Scholarship. Now, I don't know the official name of it, but you want to tell listeners what that is? That's right. The Robin Williams Scholarship, which unfortunately, um, after his death, no longer exists, but it was actually given to me at the end. It was given to me at the end of my second year, and it is a full ride scholarship for the final two years of your training. It doesn't pay for your housing, so I still had to uh, do work study to help meet the costs on my housing, but my tuition was fully covered for my junior and senior year at Juilliard, and that was um, something I probably couldn't have continued my education without. And as Robin Williams was one of my greatest heroes, it was one of my uh, proudest things to achieve. And little tiny anecdote, I wrote him several letters over the course of the next two years and thanking him, inviting him to every play. At one point, I also played a clown in a Shakespeare play, and I invited him saying, hey, if you want to make sure I'm not wasting your money, come watch me play this clown. Mm -hmm. Um, I I never heard back from him on any of those letters, but when he was on Broadway, I waited at the stage door after I saw his performance. And when he came out to sign autographs, I shook his hand and I said, sir, I just want to let you know I was the recipient of the Robin Williams Scholarship at Juilliard. I couldn't have continued my education without it. I just wanted to thank you person to person. And he looked me in the eye and he said, when you make money, scholarship a kid. So it's my intention um, when I make some money to bring that scholarship back. That is amazing. That is awesome. Yeah. Love Thank that you. story. Um, 
I want to wrap it up uh, over the next couple minutes um, with some of the thoughts. We, we get questions from students from, from all directions, social media, in person, over the phone, et cetera. Um, some of the things that have changed since you and I were auditioning is that a lot of these advanced actors are actually now really interested in double majoring. They're, they're like, how do you feel about um, double majoring in theater and like architecture? Or I have a really interest in marine biology and is there a possibility of getting a minor? Like what's your recommendation there? So I just wanted to posit that question to you. If you were speaking with a student who was, uh, you know, advanced and talented and interested in a top school, but also had an interest in another industry entirely, uh, what would you say to them? Like, is it possible? Is it possible? Wow. I mean, uh, that's so far removed from my experience of drama school because my experience of drama school was all encompassing. I mean, we were there 13 hours a day, but I know that at a lot of these great liberal arts programs, you can, you can have a double major. And I think also, um, you know, the three of us were 18 years old when we started and that's right. an intense time to jump into something um, that all encompassing, I think. Whereas some of our other classmates, I remember Sheldon, our, our oldest classmate, for instance, would say, man, I could never have done this when I was 18. I don't know how you guys yeah. do this. So mm -hmm. I do think that there's an opportunity if you can um, get a degree in something like marine biology while doing plays at your college. And at the end of those four years, you walk away with your degree and you feel like, I, I really want to give this a shot there's amazing three-year MFA programs. And I feel like a lot of people who have the aptitude and the talent also need to go experience life because as an 18-year-old, it's your first time out away from the house. It's your first time um, being independent in that kind of way. There's so much that you're experiencing for the first time. And um, I know some of our classmates felt robbed of a traditional college experience. And if they had been able to come to a conservatory after having had a traditional college experience, they felt that they may have had less resentment or they may have been more of a complete person. And so I really uh, encourage if someone wants to study something else, I really encourage that that's a positive thing and that that doesn't shut the door on also devoting yourself to drama at a later time or on the side. Yeah. Absolutely. That's great. That's a, that's a perfect response. Um, and you know, just on my take on that, when, when I speak with kids, it's like, there was no, you know, I think it's good information for them to understand that there was no other consideration in my mind. Like when you study acting at a conservatory, or if you're applying to a conservatory, you need to mm -hmm. pretty much understand that that is a full-time commitment. Now, there are other theater programs that are less rigorous. Those are typically not conservatory programs. Um, and they're, they're, the strength of those programs is that they have some more diverse studies and some more Absolutely. interesting college experiences. But I, um, I think it's uh, important to hear that, okay, if I'm applying to Juilliard or some similar conservatory, I need to know that that's an all encompassing experience, like you said. Yeah, yeah, totally. And I think that it, it can be very helpful to have other experiences before that if you if you want to have those experiences, because as an actor, what you draw on is your humanity and the experiences you've had. And uh, you can only be made richer as a performer by having life experience. Mm hmm. Mm hmm. All right. So let's wrap it up, man. I mean, I hope that, uh, you know, there's so many more hours we could spend uh, and hopefully you can come back on another podcast sometime later, or we can have you as a guest on our YouTube lives. It would just be so fun. Um, but for now, let's, let's share some final thoughts for these drama school hopefuls. What would you want to leave them with? I would leave them with this thought that when you go to audition for drama schools, and you walk into these rooms that are innately intimidating, and you're looking at uh, a table of four to five people sitting behind a table, holding pens and clipboards, looking at you, and you feel a little bit like um, a lab mouse or something. I think it's important to remember that they want to fill their program with great young students. They're not looking to get rid of you. They're looking to find you. They're looking to bring you in. And I think it's so easy to walk into these rooms and think, oh, I'm going to be one of the hundred that doesn't make it. But I think it's important to remember that they're not 
they're not looking to not accept 100 people. They're looking to find the 20 that they want. And you may be among them, and you may not, but it's, it, isn't a, uh, it isn't an account of who you are as a person. It's an account of what they're looking for in their training program. And so I think that that can take away some of the feelings of being personally affronted by this. And I think that also it can be um, more life-affirming to walk into these rooms and know they're, they're looking to say yes. They're not looking to say no. Yeah. And I think it's important to remember that. That's amazing. Hey, everybody, thanks for listening. And with that, we'll sign off. Thank you so much, Gabe. Have an awesome day. My pleasure. Best of luck, everyone.